Um, one, one, one other thing, though, to add. So um, we will be having a men's meeting this Thursday coming up. So those, uh, I, I went to the men. I said, listen, guys, if you want to keep doing this, you need to come to me and let me know. Well, that never happened, so I'm coming back to you again for the second time. Leaders, we need leaders, we need men of God, huh? <laughs> there are amazing men in here. Oh, boy. Yeah. All right. You guys ready? Okay. Let me empty my pockets. <laughs> All right, turn in your Bibles to the book of Exodus. And, um, and, and just mark, um, mock them, no, uh, keep your finger in Exodus 14. And um, this, is, uh, this is really an amazing book for the Christian, even though it's Old Testament. This is, we can learn so much from just what took place here. And the word exodus, by the way, means deliverance uh, or departure. And um, it's where God's people were in bondage, were in slavery. And, um, and it's, a, it's, it's a great picture of us as Christians uh, when we are living in sin and living into the world and we're not saved, we have not been born twice or born again, whatever way you want to use it. Um, but we are in sin. And the Bible tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because of that, it's the reason why you need a personal Savior. Your good works how good you are as a person, unfortunately, does nothing for you. You can't stand before a holy God and say, I'm good. It, it just, it's not going to work. It doesn't work. And it's the reason why Jesus Christ had to come and die for you personally. So this exodus, this amazing work, God had a people who were in bondage and in slavery. And he rose up a person and sent that person to deliver them. And Moses is a type of Christ. And he delivered the children out of that bondage, um, out of slavery. And it, it, it has such a great picture to us, and we're going to go into that a little bit. In chapter 13, right before we get to this, is the beginning of that exodus. It's the start of it. It's where um, Pharaoh finally after his heart had been hardened so many times, gives up and says, get these people out of here. Just take them. And that's really what it took place. And God would use, at that time, he would set up two amazing things that would lead and guide the people. It would be a, a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by the day. And that is, and God would lead. And the people would have to follow. When that stopped, people would stop. When it would go, people would go. And, and I love the last verse in chapter 13, verse 22. It says, and he took not away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night. And I love that. Such an amazing word for us as, as believers that he did not take away this provision. And God doesn't take away the Holy Spirit, the one that leads us and directs us and guides us into all truth. He never takes that away from you. Sometimes we think that, boy, I'm all in this all alone. But no, no, God is with you. God is with you. And, and you know, all this garbage starts to come into my life when I realize that I'm doing it by myself. And I don't have God's direction. And I don't know it. So that, that was the start of it. So here's the pillar and the cloud. And it starts to take them out of Egypt. The word Egypt, the meaning, the spiritual meaning is, is the world. 
Egypt was a type of the world system. And we are now being taken out of that world system, just like Israel here is going to be taken out of that system, completely removed from slavery and bondage and the effects that sin has upon people. This is what it's a picture of, okay? So in verse 14, verse 1, and Lord, just bless these thoughts to us. And um, thank you for your people. And I pray for those that even aren't here today, Lord, just um, minister to them and stir us up in Jesus' name. Verse 14, verse 1, chapter 14, verse 1. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before the, uh-oh, uh, Piheroth between Migdal and the sea, over against Balazaphon, before it shall, you shall encamp by the sea. So here's what's going on. They, God takes them out of Egypt. And he takes, if you look at it and think about it, they went the wrong way. God took them the wrong way. And, and, and this is puzzling to us. And in your life, as you walk in your life, do you think sometimes you're going the wrong way? But there, there's a plan for going the wrong way that God even deals with in your life. And it's so amazing how he can do that and he does that. This is done on purpose. And, and you say, wait, why are we going this way? Because what's going to happen is they're going to come to the end of the road. They're going to come where they're faced right in front of the sea. They can't go no more. The sea's going to be there. And eventually Egypt, the Egyptians, are going to be coming after them. So you're going to come across and you're as far as you can go and the enemy that had you in slavery and had you in bondage and had you a slave to sin is now coming back after you. And this is a, like a picture of our life. It seems like we're always bombarded with what we were delivered from. It keeps coming, it keeps coming, and it keeps coming after us. And they can't turn to the left or to the right because that's all wilderness. There's nowhere to go. There is no place to go. So they're trapped between the sea and they're trapped between the Egyptian army. Verse 3, and look what God does. He says, for Pharaoh will say, so God even puts this into Pharaoh. When, when, when Pharaoh realizes this, he's going to say these things. He's going to say to the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land of the wilderness no, they are entangled in the land, and the wilderness has shut them in. And these two things I want to look at a minute. They are entangled in the land, and the wilderness has shut them in. And this seems like a, a pretty hopeless condition. This, this word entangled in the Hebrew and in the Greek have very similar meanings. Matter of fact, they tie to one another. Um, most uh, Hebrew words, uh, the, you know, the, the key to try to figure them out is to see if they have a Greek meaning because that's how far they go back because God's word never changes. But these two words are, ama are, the, are very similar to the, the same. So the word entangled in the Hebrew is book, B-U-K, and, um, and what it means is confused. And it's amazing how the enemy brings in a confusion in, in, our, in, in our minds and in our thoughts. And um, remember, in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, it says God is not the author of confusion. And, and that's such an amazing uh, thing to think about. Um, oh, and by the way, we're, you know what that, um, that whole area in 1 Corinthians 14 is talking about? Where God says there's, you know, I'm not a God of confusion. The whole subject matter is about the gift of tongues. <laughs> and, and it's like so many people are confused about it. And it's still happening. There's such a confusion uh, about it. And, um, 
But God is not the author of confusion. God is not the author of, you know, have you thought, have you been confused in your thinking? We, we must realize that that is not from the kingdom of God. It's, it's, it's another source. It's another kingdom that's trying to influence you in the way you think. To, a, to an extent where you cannot, um, you, you cannot come to clarity. So I live in this confusion. I live in things that are not making sense or um, I, I, I don't understand or I can't comprehend. Like, like even this, why would God take us out of bondage and bring us to a place where we can't even go no more, where we're at the end of it? And, um, and that, that could be very confusing. <laughs> you know, like we think we can figure out God every step, you know, and what is he doing? And, you know, it's... I, I don't know if anybody here has ever played chess, but in chess you must think eight, nine moves ahead or you're done. And it, it, God's 150,000 moves ahead. You know, we, you know, that, that's, and, and this is, there's a reason and a purpose for going this route, believe it or not. We don't like this route. We shouldn't be going this route. There's no prosperity in this route. I'm not being healed in this route. I've got all these issues going this way. Yeah, well, that's where you're going. And, and, and the overall plan is going to be amazing. And the thing about going a wrong way that we think is wrong, we buck against the system the entire way. I fight against it. I complain against it. I murmur against it. This isn't fair. This isn't right. This, what is God, you know, I'm, I'm going the other way. I'm not going this road no more, you know. And, uh, and then you... Walk in circles for 40 years, because that's what they did. 40 years. 40 years it took them to get the world out of them. Is the world still in you? Are you still confused by things of the world? Yeah. And, um, oh, by, by the way, the, um, the Greek word is an echo. E-N-C-H-O, an echo. And it means to be, um, um, uh, um, it's, it's like ensnared. So this entanglement is like an ins- being ensnared. So now I'm ensnared and I'm confused. And, um, and I don't know if you've ever been um, yourself been entangled. You know, there's many things that entangle us. You know, life itself entangles us. You know, we're entangled with all these different things in life. But, um, but the enemy brings that into our life on purpose. Sometimes our marriages are entangled or, or confused, and, and, you know, there's no unity there. It, it's just I'm every which way. My thoughts are all over. My thinking is all over. My emotions are all uh, out of whack. And, and I'm, I'm entangled. I'm, I'm, I'm like lost. I'm lost in the situation. Um, you could be saved, but lost in your thinking. But then there's the other person that's not even saved at all, and they're entangled in sin, the Bible tells us. So it's, bo- it's both ways. And Satan's job is to keep them that way. Keep them lost, keep them confused, keep them entangled, keep them ensnared for as long as he can. Keep thinking in insecurity and watch where that brings you. Keep thinking in negativity and watch what that does to you. It's part of Satan's old plan to keep your mind thinking that. And when your mind starts to think of it, the mouth speaks it. And whatever comes out of the mouth is from where? The heart. So these areas are entangled. We are entangled in the land. We are entangled in the land. Um, we, we think negativity. We think defeat. You ever talk about something? They're always thinking defeat. You know, they're already in defeat and it hasn't even happened yet, you know. But, but that's the mindset. It's the mindset of, of sometimes how we think. And it's, it's, it's a mind that's, that's really entangled here. Um, when I'm held in being entangled, I struggle more because I'm struggling to untangle myself. And boy, what does that get you? I mean, it's 
Yeah, you, you, you start getting more entangled. You ever run into a spider web? I mean, you, you're, you're going like this all over the place. You can't get it out. I mean, I remember, I, 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 I took the garbage out, and it always happens. This is, that's why Cindy just plops it there, you know. No, but, but, uh, but when I, 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 I thought I got it out, and it's, it's about 15 minutes later, I went to reach for something, and I felt it again. I mean, it's like what, it, it, but that's this entanglement. It's, it's what, you can't see it, but you know it's there, and, um, and, and we live in it. We live in it. So they're, they're entangled in the land, and, and then it says, and the wilderness has shut them in. And this is an this is amazing thing, because the wilderness speaks here basically of, of a, a place that's uninhabited. And if it's uninhabited, it means there's no life. And, and this is what the wilderness does to people. It tells them, and it speaks to them that they have no life. You've, you're, you're not living. You're, you're, you're just as dead as you were when you were in, in Egypt. There's no difference. It's worse here than it was even in Egypt. This is the thoughts and the confusion that now starts to come into my mind. But I'm shut in. I'm shut in, and it means you, you're, a pris- you're imprisoned. You, know, you were in prison when you were in Egypt, and there's no difference in your new creation. When they got delivered out of Egypt, that's what it spoke about. You've got a new life. You got new, well, what kind of life is this? Why would anybody want this life? Why would anybody want a new life where God takes me the wrong way? And, and, and now my situation is worse than it was. At least I got food over here. At least, they, well, at least, at least that's what they thought. But we'll, we'll see. So, so these, these two amazing words, entangled and confused, and the wilderness being shut up uh, or, or shut in. And, um, and, and in verse 4 it says, so God says Pharaoh's going to say that. He hasn't said it yet. God is going to make him say this part. And um, so Pharaoh's going to get an insight of they went the wrong way. And, and, and he's going to jump on this. He says, and I will harden, verse 4, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he's going to follow after them, and they will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, and the Egyptians are going to know that I am the Lord. And look at that last part. And they did so. They did exactly what God said he's going to do. He got a vision of them there, and, and what they did Next is he took all his chariots, and there's, there's basically 600 of them, 600 chariots and horses chasing after the children from behind. And what comes from behind? We talked about that last week. Remember, that's our enemy, where we get hedged in, and there's what's before and what's behind. Our, our behind is everything from our past. It's our guilt. It's our shame. It's being condemned. It's the mind that thinks up of all these things, all these things that happened to me in my life. And, and I start to look inward instead of looking unto God. And we've all got a past. And some of you, it's worse than others. And I'm not downgrading that. But what I do know is you've got a new life. You've got a new future. And Satan cannot touch your present. He can only affect your past. And, and, and God's given you a brand new life. And, and it's wonderful. Even if it's in, even it's, if it's up against a place where you can't go no more. But God, because God is there too. It's like the children, right, in uh, Babylon. Uh, you know, I'm not, we're, I am not, we're not going to bow our knee to you. If we die, we burn. But if we live, God will deliver us. You know, and that's, that's how you've got to look at it, you know, uh, because he has you and he knows you. Um, okay, so drop down to verse 10. Exodus 14, 10. It says, and when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. 
And behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were so afraid, and they cried out to the Lord. One thing that happened here is, um, as a picture, is they lifted up their eyes. And, um, and the Bible says this a few times, you know. Um, one of the stories is the one with Abraham and Lot. And Abraham says, listen, you want to go to the left, I'll go to the right. You want to go to the right, I'll go to the right. You choose. You, you tell me where you want to go, and I'll go the other way. And it says, and Lot lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and he saw how beautiful and, and the abundance of, of everything flowing um, in Sodom. But things that look and appear as a blessing it would be the worst thing that could happen to his soul. Um, and God ended up destroying that entire city because of wickedness and evil. And, um, and it says in this, the world, um, you, you know, we, we can know some of the signs, he says, and, and one of the things says, and it will be like in the same time as Sodom and Gomorrah. And, um, and we, we start to see some of this unfold even now. Crazy things that people think and do and, uh, because they are controlled by the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. So um, Satan has blinded them, blinded them from truth, blinded them from truth. So it says, it says here, that they lifted up their eyes, and we are never to look. Uh, we are never to walk by what we see, and this becomes the problem of many. This is where depression comes in, loneliness comes in, uh, the abundance of grief and anxiety comes in. All of this comes in by sight, by the way, all of it. So if you're living in depression or living in anger or fear, anxiety or stress, it's because we're walking by sight too much. And we're never told to walk by sight. The believer is told to walk by faith. We don't walk by what we see and we don't walk by how we feel. Your feelings will deceive you. They will turn you another way. They'll say, let's turn around and go the other way. Even if it's away from God. And, and many have done it. But we, we, we are to walk by faith. It's once they lifted up their eyes, you know, they knew Soon as they lifted up their eyes, fear fell upon them. Ain't that amazing? When you, I mean, even today in the world, when you, when you look out and see something or you hear something on the news, you automatically go into fear. Automatically. You've got no details of what's going on, but they're saying it's going to be a problem. Okay, I believe that. And, and we take the word of God and we just move it away because I've got to live in, in this feeling right now. I got to live in this anxiety. I have to live in this fear. No, you don't. We don't need to live by these things. They are fear, anxiety, and stress are ruling factors over your life. They want to rule you. And then you know what you do? You take that fear and you rule others because you think you have an influence on them. And that's how, that's, that, that's how all of those emotional concepts work. So, um, so, uh, so, so in verse 10, they lifted up their eyes. Verse 11, it says, and, and they said to Moses, because there are no graves in Egypt, because there's no graves there, you have brought us out here to die. You've brought us out to the wilderness to die. Uh, because there's no graves in Egypt. Now, you know what? This is par partly true. It, it is partly true. Uh, they did rebel against Moses because Moses tried to deliver him once and he failed. And so Pharaoh said, okay, fine. No more straw. Let's, no. Yeah. You're going to make bricks the same way with the same pattern with the same amount but we're taking away your material. As a matter of fact, the quote is now higher. So they blamed all that on Moses, and they said, Moses, just leave us alone. 
So they are part right, because that's what they said to him. But this is the same group of people that cried out to God and said, we are being tormented, we're in slavery, deliver us, only you can do it. So it goes both ways here. So here's the thing. When, you, when we have no faith in life, and faith comes by, and hearing by, that's how you get faith. No other way. You don't get faith by, oh, strumming, oh, I want that car. Oh, you know. No. It's not strum, It's not faith in yourself. It's not faith in faith. It's faith in God. And everybody says they do that, and everybody says amen to it, but they still continue to name it and claim it that way. It's, it's false faith. And you might get the car. It doesn't mean nothing, you know. So, um, so when there's no faith, then there's no hope. And when there's no hope, there's no vision. And when there's no vision, there's no victory. It, 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 it's a crumbling pattern to lift up your eyes and to walk by what you see. Yeah. So, um, verse 12. Look at this. It, it is not this the word that we did tell you in Egypt saying, let us alone? This is what Egypt's saying. To Just leave us alone that we may better serve the Egyptians for it's better for us to serve the Egyptians that we should die than, than we should die in the wilderness. You know, this 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 little thing of let us alone is, you know, it's you know, the flesh wants to be left alone. The flesh wants to isolate itself. And this is why God says, I'm gonna do something great. I'm gonna give you a body of believers, just like you, all messed up. All messed up, and you're going to come in unity together, and you're going to think you you th- you're going to think you have everything together. But boy, we need each other. Look to the person next to you and say, "I need you." Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amazing. It, we need each other. We need each other. <laughs> yes. Yes. The flesh also wants to be a slave to sin. So, you know, and, and I, love, I love this part. It says, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in the wilderness. You know, God's plan for them was to die in the wilderness, though. Die to the flesh. Die to the world system that was in them. They, they were living, it took 40 years to get that out of them. But that's what God wanted. He wanted to die to that system and die to slavery and bondage. And it really, it's really something when people have been set free and have victory and there's no chains, but then they decide to go back to Egypt and live. And they live in their addictions and they live in their feelings because they don't know they're delivered. God is greater than all of that. God is greater than all of that. So he wants the flesh to die. It's like, if you want to follow me, take up your cross. It's dying to the self-life. And uh, even, in, even in Romans 6, it says, uh, don't you know that you're already dead? <laughs> That's, we don't know it. You are dead to self and alive unto God. When you became born again, you are a new creation. Old things are passed away. Let them pass. Stop resurrecting the past because there's nothing there. And once one learns to die, then they learn to live. Then they're resurrected. Then they're resurrected. Life comes from the seed that has died. The seed must fall to the ground and die. And if it doesn't, it bides alone. But if it does, then it, then it grows. Then it produces fruit. Now you're living. In abundance, but um, the death of the flesh sometimes is very hard because we're all about preserving ourselves. Got to preserve ourselves. And just when you're walking good with God, all of a sudden something comes up and we raise ourselves from the dead, raise that flesh back up, wrecking it dead. 
I love that, yeah. I reckon. Okay, um, 15. Where are we going? Okay, we're good. Drop down to 15. Um, well, let me do 13 because I do like this. I'm sorry, Ryan, yeah, or Stephanie. Stephanie. Let's hear for Stephanie. Yeah, hey, Stephanie. <laughs> she hates what I do there. Don't roll your eyes at me. <laughs> and Moses said unto the people, Fear not, and stand still, and you will see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you this day. That's amazing. This isn't sometime later on down the road. No, right today, you can see the salvation of God in your life. It's an amazing thing. These Egyptians who, who you see today, you will never see them again. What a, what a thing, and I love that. The first thing he deals with is their fear. You know, God's always going to deal with your fear. Because if you're living in fear, he can't speak to your heart. Because you're too occupied with your fear and anxiety, and, stre and, and whatever else you want to add. You know, and it's a, uh, I heard uh, Pastor Ronaldo say this morning, it's, it, it's, it's the reason why Christ, on the first day into Jerusalem, turned over the tables. The tables got to be turned over. <laughs> in, the, in the holy place, <laughs> in the place of worship, turn the tables over. It's a beautiful thing. So fear not. He comforts them. God always comforts us. Even when a little bit of fear starts to come in, God can comfort us. It's a beautiful thing. And, th and then how about this? Stand still. That's a beautiful thing. So he deals with the fear, and then he just tells you to stand. And standing is such an amazing thing within the Bible because it speaks of, of um, our position and not our condition. Our condition could be fearing. Our position is you are seated in heavenly places. You're with Christ. And when things come our way, when all this fear and anxiety, we must learn to stand in what God has said about you, not on how you feel. How you feel is going to bring in fear. Your, your position is going to bring in eternal truth. That's called the finished work. It is finished. So we learn to stand in the salvation. I stand in my salvation. And it means nothing can take that salvation away because they didn't give it. It's really funny how people tell, tell other people they can lose their salvation. Did you give it to them? You're, you didn't give them the salvation, but you can take it away? Come on. Come on. Read the Bible. Let the Bible speak to you. You know, let the, let the word of God settle that once and for all in your life. You are eternally secure in him. Salvation was given to you as a gift from God. It can't be taken away by man who's in the same boat for, as you are needing salvation from God. Anyway. Verse 14, the Lord God shall fight for you. Is that a great memory verse for you? The Lord God shall fight for you. Now hold your peace. Don't allow the enemy to take your peace from you. Peace is a gift from God. The enemy is trying to steal your peace. Not as the world I give you. I don't give you peace like the world is saying peace. They want world peace. Kumbaya. Let's... No, God's peace is in us. It's, it's a gift from God, and it settles you. God's peace settles you for the wilderness coming, and the wilderness is going to come here. It, it, it doesn't mean that that's going to go away, but God will give you peace. And then um, 15, and the Lord said to Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Look, I like this. Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. There's another good verse there for you. There, there's nothing healthy. There's nothing spiritual. There's no life in going backwards. 
And some people have to go backwards a few times before they learn to go forward. You know, and God's just, you know, being very patient and very long-suffering and loving with you as he takes us forward. We must be going forward. Even in standing still, you're going forward because you're obeying what he told you to do and stand still. It's just, it's just being obedient in faith to the one who promised it. Romans 1.5. So go forward. Go forward. So, um, and then 16, he says, and this is God speaking to Moses, but you're going to lift up your rod. You're going to stretch it forth. It's going to be over the sea, and, you're gonna, and that sea is going to divide. What you thought was the end of your life is now going to separate. And, and it says, and the children of Israel are going to go forth on dry ground through the midst of the sea. So this is, um, this is a really wonderful miracle, of course, but what a spiritual, what, a, what spiritual teaching that it gives to the believer. So um, just a couple more verses and we'll wrap this up. Uh, go to 21, because here's now the crossing. This is where Moses puts this into play. He stretches forth his hands over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and it made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. You know, this is incredible because... God delivered them out of Egypt, out of slavery. And, and, it, and if anybody here has accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, this is, your, this is what took place in your life. It is, a, it is a picture where God delivered you out of sin, out of slavery, out of Egypt, out of the world system, out of Pharaoh, which is a picture of the devil, who controls you. He got he victory over all of that and then brought you to a place and he separated the sea. And this sea, as we see in verse 22, it says, or 23, it says, when the Egyptians pursued, um, all, all Pharaoh's horsemen and all the chariots, something like that, and, um, and, and, and the waters came in upon them and judged them. And just like God said to Moses, these Egyptians that pursue you, that you see today, you will see them no longer. And the water came over them and judged them. And the picture, the spiritual picture for us is all the Israelites walked on cr across on dry ground, which means there's no judgment. There's no judgment to one of them. There's no judgment to the believer. We walk across on dry land. Not one drop of judgment came upon them. Not one. They walked freely across the whole area on dry ground. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn thee. And, and to learn that you are not condemned no more in your life, that you are walking on victory and you're walking across on dry ground is such a beautiful picture. Because judgment will never be for the believer. All the judgment of the world was placed upon Jesus Christ on the cross. He took the judgment for you that you may live, that you may have eternal life, that you can walk on dry ground, no condemnation, no guilt, no shame. You don't need to live in that thing anymore. Guilt, shame, and condemnation is everything from your past. It's all behind you. It's all being flooded under judgment. You're walking across on dry ground. We must start walking this way. We must start believing this in our life, that there's no condemnation to the believer. Romans 8, 1 and John chapter 8. Read these things. Get this within us. We don't, don't condemn yourself. Sometimes it's so easy to put guilt upon yourself because of your past or because of what you did or what you didn't do. 
But you know what? God's going to take them into the wilderness. It's not going to be a fun time there either. They're going to learn. They're going to complain. They're going to murmur against God. They're going to do all these things against them. He even is going to tell Moses one time, let me wipe them out and start all over. They're that bad. And he's talking about his people. <laughs> he's talking about his children. He's talking about us. Let me start over. Let me get a, now, and Moses says, what would our enemies say if you did that? That you brought them out and killed them in the wilderness? And, and, and it's amazing. And this is why Moses, you know, having a heart after God. Do we think about souls? Do we think about people who are struggling in their walk? Because you know what? We, you have a message. And it's the message of no condemnation. There's the message that we can walk to on, on dry ground and never be judged. Never be judged for our past. Never be judged for our sin. Never. Never. And yet, and yet this condemnation, we talk to a lot of people on the phone, the condemnation, the guilt, the depression, it just keeps building and building and building and building. And sooner or later, it, it can't build no more. It just explodes. And many people are living in this condition because they don't know that they're forgiven. They don't know that there's no condemnation from God. And, you know, the opposite of that is he accepts you. He accepts you in the beloved. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you, baby. <laughs> we, we, we praise you. We thank you, God, for your word. The word of God that speaks to us clear through, through, through amazing stories in the Bible. Stories of old, landmarks of old. The landmark still stands and we get to feed off of that. And it becomes a picture to the, the, uh, the, new ch to the church. It becomes a picture to the church because you built your church and you save your people. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we love you. Lord, uh, bless the offering and, um, and bless the food today at our wrap next door and the bustelo, the coffee. We got bustelo today. Thank you, Lord. We just praise you. Uh, if there's somebody here that's living in a lot of guilt and condemnation, uh, you know, from their past, um, we, uh, we need to learn to leave that there because that's what Christ came for. It's hard to have any type of victory when we're living in these things that cripple us, that control us, that uh, try to lead us. Lord, we thank you. We love you. Just uh, receive Christ. Maybe you've never accepted him as your Savior. Maybe you don't know what it is to trust him. Maybe you were in church all your life, but you've never heard the gospel that has a, a full relationship with you. It's not about the building of the church or the denomination that you were raised under.